Like, why does life need to be meaningful? It doesn't. I mean, a lot of Olympians have huge depression after they get a gold because now what? Like, of course, if it doesn't make you happy, you suck at it. You're not in the day-to-day. -day. Like, what is that that make you feel happy? Yeah. Well, right off the bat, I don't optimize for subjective well-being. I do that more for the audience. I, that's never been a goal of mine. Um, I think when I was 19 or 20, I said, fuck happiness, and I've pretty much stuck with that. Um, There's two, two concepts I'll, I'll, I'll bring up on this. So one is people who want to be happy treat it like I want to eat so good I'm never hungry again. Or I want to sleep so well I never need to sleep again. But I think happiness is, is much more like that than it is this, this achievement thing that you like check a box off. It doesn't really work that way. Secondly, I think that all the people that I know who obsess about happiness are the least happy people. Outwardly, sure, but they're the ones who are like committing suicide. I, I worry about that because that it's a goal that by having it as a goal, it automatically sits outside of you, which means there's space between you and the goal, which means you're not actually happy. My goal is to be happy, which means you aren't right now. So I have made meaning which is ironic because I don't find things inherently meaningful. But I have, find, I have found meaningful work as I deem meaningful um, to be the thing that I derive the most joy from. And so I have it broken down to a more tactical level, which is what days have I enjoyed and looked back on and been proud of myself for that day. And over probably a three or four year period, I just looked at the good days and the bad days and I looked at what the good days had in common, and I looked at what the bad days had in common. I've just, over time, minimized the things that happen on the bad days and maximized the things that happen on the good days. Even to, even to big investments. Like, I am much happier when I work out. Like, rather, not even much happier when I work out. When I look back on my day, this was a good day, almost always has a workout in it. And usually with people I like. And so workouts take probably longer for me than most people. Because I'm not the, uh, I'm in and out in 45 minutes and I, you know, you know, did my, my morning routine and I can do, send out 40 emails from whatever. It's every, everyone's different. But for me, I work out for like two hours. It's because I like to. And so I do it. And I do it with people that I like. And so I'm willing to invest the time because like, what's the point anyways? Like why make all the money to what? Enjoy it, like I enjoy doing that so I do that every day. Um, I like writing. So I write for, you know, four to six hours a day. Um, and those are probably the two biggest activities that I do. And if I can write with somebody that I like, then I do something I like with people I like. And I think that that's probably been the, the, the single simplest formula, is doing things you like with people you like and trying to maximize as much time as I can on, the, on the, that bucket. And then everything else I try and minimize as overhead or outsource. Most people are like, why am I not happy? They also see a problem with them not happy. They have it as an expectation of the world and the universe that they should be happy, right? And to the same degree, people have an expectation that life should be, should be meaningful. Like, why does life need to be meaningful? Why does the universe need to make you happy? It doesn't. You can choose that, but it's just like not a requirement. And so they think there's something wrong with it when in reality, like you're alive and you might procreate, you might not, but like, that's the only reason that you're here. Oh man, there we go. Broke my wedding ring. It's a sign. What is it I don't know, silicon. It's like my third one. I break them every like two years. As a side note, this is fucking incredible. Oh, cool. Yeah. Really good shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. Whatever really? you need to take that shit again on Thursday. Oh, <sighs> it smells like commitment. I, I, <laughs> so like, if I if I boil it down, like happiness is is fleeting because you get hungry again, you get sleepy again. Um, meaning, you can only really tell at the end. Like, did I do something that, that contributed? But on the day-to-day -day perspective, I can know that what I'm doing is useful. And if what you're doing is not useful, then I think that that's harder. And I also think, I also think that men and women are different here. So we use like ha happy, I hate the term in general, but like, I think men and women want different things out of life. And I think we, we bucket them together. It's also the same degree like why um, therapy with men um, doesn't work necessarily the same. We have to have a different approach. Like people think men need more love and I just don't think that's true. I think we want more respect. And like you get respect from being useful. 
And so I, I, I make that the goal. Like no one casts aside a man who is useful. And being useful is an attractive trait. Like if you see someone who's really good at something, it's hard like for you know, like women, it's like that is a, it's a contributing member of society. They do stuff like that help other people. We want them here. Like you get status from that. And so that means that skill mastery in a very real way can help you attract the mate you want, which is why I indexed a ton of my life around getting better at stuff. So like, and also from a stress perspective, people are like, I remember, I see sometimes these podcasts from, from successful entrepreneurs and, and they're like, man, I'm still worried I could lose it all tomorrow. I don't have that. Like I'm genuinely not afraid of losing it all tomorrow because I have lost it before and I got it back. And I think it's like, if you have a, like if you were lucky, because there are guys who get lucky. And if you are lucky, then absolutely you should be worried about it because if you do lose it, you don't know how to get it back. But if you have skills, then like, I know that I can go to any business and help grow it. Like, it, and that's valuable, that's useful. And so even reframing the word value as usefulness is probably also an easier way to do it for people to kind of like comprehend. But I think if you make that the goal, it also takes it away from you. So the reason I hate, so there's a, I would say I have a, a friend-ish, um, well, I have a friend who, who's, who's single and struggles because he's not happy. Successful, but not happy. And so he obsesses on happiness. And I was like, did you know that when you obsess on happiness, all you do is think about you all day? Like, it's all you're doing. You're just thinking about you all fucking day. And like, how useless. And so the nice thing with being useful is that in order to be useful, you have to be useful to other people. Like no one can be useful on their own. You have to be useful to other people. So there's a service element, but there's also a self-improvement element, which is to be useful to other people, you need to improve yourself. And so that's why I think being useful is, has been probably my day-to-day -day goal of what I need to do. And that's served me well. Um, not saying anyone should or should, they can do whatever they want, but for me, that's helped me. It for sure offers clarity. They've done brain scans people with depression, mm -hmm. and the areas of the brain that are responsible for like self-reflection and rumination are like overly active. Yeah, they think about themselves too much. Um, I mean, this is a Tony Robbins quote. He said, if you stay in your head, you're dead. Um, and because it rhymes, it's true. And so, uh, <laughs> but, the, uh, but for real though, like when I, when I was 19, the reason I said fuck happiness was like I realized that I was in this cycle, this loop of trying to, like everything you analyze of like, does this make me happy? Does this pizza make me happy? Does this class make me happy? I mean, I quit pre-med because I thought biology didn't make me happy. Now I'm very glad that I did because I like business a lot more now, but like that was the reason I did it. I studied really hard, I did well, but I was like, this doesn't make me happy. Like, of course it fucking doesn't make you happy. You suck at it. You're, you're learning something. You're going to suck for a very long time. It's only when all these skills go together that you'll be good at something and you'll actually be useful to society. Of course, you learning the fucking chromosomes doesn't do anything. But it's because of what it shows a, shows a school that you're willing to put up with so that you might be useful to society in the particular skill set. Um, and so, yeah, I think being useful is a far better goal. And this is, this is me just shouting out specifically to men. Um, if you could just just try it, try try this on for a month. If you're on, if you're happy, do whatever the fuck you. Well, really, just do whatever you want either way. But if what you're working isn't working for you, or what you're doing isn't working for you, um, I would I would try this on for size. One, say that you're going to stop trying to be happy. Just give up on it. Just like just stop thinking about it. Like I'm not. You know what? I'm actually okay with being unhappy. I'm fine with it. I'm I'm still here. Like it doesn't mean anything. Okay. And so then you can take action despite your lack of happiness and think, okay, how can I be useful to other people? And I think if you do that, you'll actually start focusing on the tasks and on people outside of yourself, and you'll be amazed at how much better you feel overall. And what happened to me when I went into my fuck happiness thing is that I stopped thinking about happiness altogether, and then like years later, I was like, you know what? Because I was so used to, because like I wanted to label myself that way and be okay with it, people would ask me like, Hey, X, Y, Z, I'd be like, oh, I'm not a happy person. I would just like say that up front. That way I didn't have to. And I remember catching myself um, probably like five years later. And I was like, huh, I say that. I was like, but I actually really do like my life a lot. So I stopped saying I'm not a happy person because like I actually kind of do like my life. Um, but I feel like I only got to liking my life by being willing 
to not like what I was doing for a long period of time. It's like also what time frame are you thinking about? Totally. Yeah, like most of the things that feel good for you are, what is it, feel good or bad for you in the long run, but also like things that feel bad are probably good in the long run. I actually, um, I, I only disagree because it's so vague. Because like, I think people just only think of the things that quote feel good, but there's tons of things that feel good that are not bad for you. Like sex feels good, it's not bad for you. You know, like, it's just, we immediately jump to like cigarettes, booze, you know, whatever. But it's really anything in excess is bad for you. Like if so much sex that you don't go to work, you don't eat, it's bad for you. You know what I mean? If you, like, even cigarettes, like if you have one cigarette a week, it doesn't do anything for you. Probably have, you smoke more than that just walking outside. You know what I mean? For a week in terms of just, car, you know, CO2 from cars. So it's, it's always, you know, it's always in the dose. Yeah, is, the, is maybe the usefulness of that. People want a binary when it's really a continuum. Mm. What do you mean by that? People say, oh, I like it, therefore, they want a simple rule, but like life has way more continuums than binaries. Like good and bad, like first off, define good, define bad. Second off, like, like, <laughs> like it or not, how much, you know, to what degree, how often, like what, what is good, like, Whatever. I mean, a really fun one is that I think, um, so Dr. Cashy and I have talked about this, but like there's this whole thing on drinking a glass of wine every day, Reservatrol is one of the key ingredients that's like anti-cancer fighting, whatever. Um, but if you look at like centenarians, people who live over 100, a disproportionate amount of them smoke. And so I find that interesting because I think that genetically it means that that person probably has some sort of protection against lung-based carcinogens which then means they get all the benefits of cigarettes and none of the downsides. And so they're able to basically benefit from all the stress-reducing components of nicotine and smoking, but then just don't get cancer. And so I would argue that like drinking a glass of wine every night has less to do with the resveratrol and more to do with the stress reduction on a continuous basis. So anyways. So interesting. Like the blue, like the blue zone research, right? Like where those people live. Mm -hmm. well, there, that's, that's diet stuff. More oh, so. Like more like diet stuff. Yeah, it's more diet stuff. Where do people smoke a lot? Everywhere but here. <laughs> yeah. We started it, spread it everywhere else, and then said it wasn't cool anymore. And everyone else was like, what the fuck? China's like, yo, we still smoke. Nicotine men make good times. I have a question for you. Do you feel like you have a better descriptor of the subjective experience you're having when you're in quote-unquote, like, the flow state, like when you're writing, sure. you wouldn't say you're happy, but I know you, I know you like writing. Yeah, yeah, what I enjoy writing. Well, I think, I think one thing is, is, is the idea of learning how to enjoy a challenge. So I think, like, I think a lot of people can get there quickly. Like a lot of people play video games because, okay, so video games are designed to increase in difficulty proportional to people's willingness to, um, Basically, they extend inter intermittent reinforcement. So your first level is always easy, and then they extend it a little bit more. They extend it a little bit more. And eventually, believe it or not, you'll have learned the behavior such that they can push it out so far they never need to reward you again, which is why people stay in abusive relationships. We're like, in the beginning, it's good. Oh, I fucked up. Oh, everything's good again. And then I fucked up more, and then it's good again. And then I fucked up more, and then it's good again. And then eventually, it's never good again. But they got reinforced on enough um, spaces each time that they stay in it. And so I think the difference between a video game and life is that that interval isn't set. And so you're not necessarily going to have a quick win at level one because it's more like you basically get none until you're at level like 20 and then all of a sudden it all comes. And so that's, I think that's the difficult part. And so I think being willing, I think athletes do particularly well, um, like college athletes do really well transitioning because they've learned a meta skill which is that you're going to suck for a long time at something before you become a master at it. And most people don't have the ability, don't have any experience mastering anything in life early on. And so they have to learn how to work. And so I think, um, I think learning to work is the most useful thing that you can do. I mean, I think for me, I love finding input output equations that equal like success of some kind. So it's like if you're giving public speaking, I'm gonna give this example because it's perfect. So um, Caleb, who's on my team, um, had said right, you know, years ago when we met, uh, like, I'm not, I don't really like public speaking, I don't like presenting, I don't like any of that stuff. I was like, cool. And I think he said something to the degree of like, I don't like it or I'm bad at it, whatever. And he did a presentation for the team and it was good. Um, and then 
uh, he had a bunch of things that he wanted to do better on the next one. Now, uh, between those time periods, I had done the book launch. And so he had seen me prepare for my presentation. And so I did it 100 times over 30 days. So I did it three times a day before I gave the book launch. And you know, when there was 500,000 people or whatever that were the launch, um, when we had 500,000 people registered for the launch and I was about to step on stage, um, the team that was doing it all said, We've done, we do this every day and I've never seen anyone so like relaxed. And it wasn't a front, it was because I had done it so many times. And so fast forward, Caleb had another presentation he had to give and this time he prepared three times as long. So he did, instead of 10 hours of prep, he did 30 hours of prep. And instead of having 80 slides, he had 330 slides. And the presentation went way better. And he noted that he wasn't nervous at all going into the second presentation compared to the first presentation. And so he messaged me afterwards and said, I, shoot, um, it wasn't that I was bad at speaking, I was just lazy. And I think that a lot of people mistakenly think they're bad at things they haven't even learned how to try. And I do think learning how to try is also domain specific. And so like Caleb's an exceptional video editor and media uh, strategist and, and, and great with building the team and those skills, but those had been skills that he knew how to work hard at. But this was a completely different skill. And so it's like writing. Like I have a lot of entrepreneur friends who are, who are writing books now. Now they don't know that I come from background of writing. I got a full writing scholarship uh, to Tufts University, which is a good school. Um, I got a personal letter from their writing seller, like, we love all your stuff, we want you to be here. I ended up going to Vanderbilt, but like, I was the vice editor of the newspaper, I was the editor in chief of the literary magazine when I was in high school, like, I like writing. And so, I know what hard, what hard work looks like in writing, which is just editing, and editing, and editing, and editing, which is basically like, doing the speech again, and doing the speech again, and doing the speech again. And it's the same as ping pong, which is 500 backhands, 500 forehands. It's, it's, just, it's just repetition, right? Um, and so right now, if you're doing work or you feel like you're not as good at something, you have to figure out what the input-output equation is. You have to figure out, like, what's the thing that I have to do a lot of? Because every skill is like this, is that there's a period where you have to do a lot of something. And if you don't know what it is, then you're not going to get better. Sales is like, I have to do 100 calls a day. I have to do, you know, I have to do 10, 10 conversations a day. Whatever it is, you do that every single day and you do that for a year, you get pretty fucking good. Um, and so you have to learn what that input output equation is so that you can push as much, if it's me, I, once I know it, then I just jam as much input as I possibly can into that thing. And then that's where the whole, the whole quote that you know, went viral was, um, confidence doesn't come from shouting affirmations in the mirror by having a stack of undeniable proof that you are who you say you are. Outwork your self-doubt. And so like you become confident by giving yourself the stack of evidence, the hundred times I went over the presentation, I felt confident going into that because I had a stack of proof that I'd already done it perfectly the last 20 times in a row that I'd done it. So why would 21 be different? And if you've had a thousand sales calls on your thousand first, if people are watching, they're like, man, you sound so confident. You're like, it's just how it is. It's not like I'm confident. I just know, I know what's going to happen next. And so I prefer to think about it as like, do it so many times you get bored of doing it. And like, that's when you'll look confident to everyone on the outside because you'll have no emotional affect to the outcome because you'll have recognized the patterns so many times that there's nothing that's going to surprise you. And I think that most people just don't know how to work that hard. Like there is no way that anyone will know how hard I've worked on the books. They just imagine that there's a reason that they're all, you know, all time bestsellers for each of the categories they're in and still. They're like, it's because you're following. It's like, no, you know why I know that? Look at every other fucking person who has a following and their books don't fucking sell, even though they have a big following. They launch it and then they stop selling. Why? Because the book sucked. They had a ghostwriter, they voiced it in, whatever. And they, they make their, whatever, five million bucks or whatever it is. They published it on the second edit instead of the next. Yeah, I mean, shit, they, they, I mean, they literally, f they, they think the book is finished when it has reached the number of pages that creates a book. Like I can write a book in two weeks if I was just trying to write a certain number of pages. But like, I've, I've usually written five times the amount of pages as what actually comes out in the final draft. And I've rewritten end to end the whole thing, not once or twice, but like 10 times, end to end. 
But you know what happens when you do that? You get really fucking good at knowing what is, what is important and what isn't. And you also give yourself way more outside life exposures that trigger new thoughts over that period of time that remind you of things that can make it better. And so it's kind of like, a, um, like when you paint. It's like, it's like putting coats of paint and letting it dry. And so I kind of see editing drafts as like another coat of paint. And then you think, you're like, you know what? I just saw that. Th like I was, I was walking, I went to a new area today and I saw this new, new yellow. I wonder if I could throw that in. If you had immediately shipped it, you wouldn't have had the opportunity to see the yellow thing because time didn't transpire during the creation of the thing. And so I think there's a reason that books that take 10 years to write look and read like they took 10 years to write. There's just a depth to the quality. Do you then now, to bring this back kind of to like the happiness or whatever we... I find happiness in figuring out what my input output equation is and doing it as much as humanly possible. Do you then engineer your environment to reinforce yourself to do more inputs? Absolutely. How do you do that? You want to make it easy as possible to work as hard as you can. And so everything that is not that input output equation is interference. And so like relationships, like, I mean, I said this before, but everything that you are not willing to sacrifice to be the best, the person who's best in the world, is willing to and already has sacrificed. And so I'm not saying good or bad, do whatever you want. But if you want to be number one, and a lot of people say, I want to be the best, it's like, no, you don't. You want to be better, and you can be really good. You can be really good and not sacrifice plenty of things. But if you want to be the best, then you just have to assume that the best person in the world has the genetic predisposition, has all the environmental, environmental cues aligned with their ultimate goal, and is willing to give up everything that is not achieving that goal. And if you're not in that boat, then you're not going to be the best. People just like saying because it makes them feel good, but it's false. Um, and so in terms of aligning the environment, if you know what the input out equation, so for me, it's writing right now is the season that I'm in because writing kind of is the, is the pillar of everything else we do content-wise, internal communications, the books, everything comes from me taking time to write because I'm, I organize my thoughts better that way and I've, because I've become skilled at writing. So it's the best way, it's the most succinct way that I can communicate. And so um, there's a reason that the first six hours of my day when I'm freshest, most well rested, I have no meetings and I have only one thing that I do, which is write. There's nothing else. And so if you know what the input out equation is, find the time, the four to six hours a day, every day, that you can do that and then allow nothing to interfere with it. And that's it. Like nothing interferes with it. And if you do that for five years, you'll be really fucking good. And you'll be useful. And you'll feel good about it. Because the thing is, at a certain point, the work itself becomes reinforcing. Like when editors edit, and then they make a change, and then the, and the, the story goes, or the video goes the way they want it to, it's like, boom, that was reinforcing. And if I like work really hard on a paragraph, and I could just shrink it to one sentence, I'm like, fuck yeah, and that might take, that literally might take two hours to just keep beating it down until I get it to like the one most succinct thing. Um, but that's satisfying. And so in the beginning you suck and you do the reps so that you can learn the skills so that eventually you do the work itself because the work itself is rewarding. But that takes time to get to. Yeah, it's like you are at this point writing the third book and it's like... My fourth book overall. Fourth book. Yes, and, you, and yeah. then getting those sentences is the, is the win, the little win. Which also makes it easier because then you're not waiting for the 6,000 Amazon. Of course. Numbers. I wonder if you could talk a little bit to that. Well, yeah. I mean, in the beginning, you start the, the start the journey because you have this big ultimate payoff you want to have. But that's way too far out to actually wait. Like, you have to be an exceptional person who's, who's been reinforced in the past for waiting for a very long period of time. That's why I say the athletes thing is kind of interesting because they've had to wait a long period of time. And so they have to practice for a long period before they get the thing. Um, but typically, they get enough reinforcers early on that that the act itself becomes reinforcing. And that's, that's, that's what mastery is, is you transition from having some sort of external motivator to external. I believe all motivators are external. But from the work itself being intrinsically rewarding versus having a carrot of some kind that's been artificially put there, like status or an award or number one or a ranking. Um, and masters can Masters enjoy the work more than novices do. So it's actually easier for masters. Do you find, ironically, that hard work has felt less hard these days? 
or is it still hard work because you're pushing? It's still hard. It's different in terms of the hard. The I would say the hard thing that I have now is that my level of quality, the standard that I have, is only mine. Like I know that I could probably put out the first draft and it would probably be a bestseller. It's just that I would know that it could have been better. And that would eat me alive. And so the hard part is still maintain. So it's actually, the hard part for me now is that I maintain my standard as the number one standard that I optimize for. And if the world so chooses to also like it, great. But it also divorces me somewhat from the outcome. Because if it were just about getting the best selling book, then I would publish it on the first shot. Because at this point, I do have enough skill that it probably would be a bestseller on its own. But I also think there's a difference between being a bestseller for a season and being a bestseller for 100 years. And so I'm trying to write these books to be bestsellers when I'm dead. So they're still useful. How do you know when you've met that bar? Like, how do you know when a sentence is like... When there's nothing else I can do to it to make it better. And you sleep on it, and then you wake up the next day and you look at it again. There's nothing else I can do to it to make it better. Same thing for the presentation. There's nothing else I can do to make this better. I can't practice it more. Because even at a certain point, when you, if you get past a certain point of practicing, you start, you start knowing it almost too well that you start cutting corners because you're like, it, it gets too natural. Like I actually, I borderline overprepared for the GMATs. Um, I like peaked, I like, cause I, I, I took tests every week and my math score, sorry, my English score peaked before my math score did. So my math score peaked at the test but my English score, I had done it so many times where you're like, shoot, man, I've done, you've, you, you recognize so many patterns that you're like, man, which pattern is this one? Because like, I'm so good at all of them, I have to remember what, like, it, 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 um, you peak, right? And so there is a point where, you, where it's not even diminishing returns, you actually start getting worse, um, at least in my opinion, or at least in my experience. And so uh, if, you, if, you, if you regress something down to its simplest form and then I just cut the sentence in half, I lose material. I lose stuff that would, that needs to be there. And so, you get it as simple as possible, but no simple. Uh, you talked about if someone comes to you and you're like, what would you do if you had six more hours on that? Mm -hmm. you, you kind of flip back on that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so a really, a really fun thought exercise for somebody who's just like, all of this is like, wow, that's so much work. I'm not really prepared for that. Well, I'll walk you through what it looks like in a micro example. So if a video editor comes to me and says, hey, do you like this clip? And I say, yeah, I do like the clip. If you had another two hours to work on it, what would you do? And they're like, well, if I had another two hours, I'd do this, this, and this. I'm like, okay, go do that, come back. They come back, and I'm like, do you think it's better? And they say, yeah, and they show it to me, and I'm like, it is better. Okay, now, if you had another two hours, what would you do? And they're like, well, I'd do this, this, and this. I'm like, okay, cool. They go, they come back, same conversation. They're like, okay, if you had a week, what would you do? Well, then they're like, well, shoot, I would I'd probably scrap this whole style overall, and I'd actually make a, a totally new framework for how I'd approach the video. Um, and I'd want to come at it from this angle altogether. It would just take you know, a lot more work, but I think it would still make a better outcome. It's like, okay. So that idea, just do it on five years. And so, everybody just wants to get it done rather than get it right. And getting it right is where all the money is. I bet you've asked yourself, like, what would you do if you had 50 years to work on acquisition? 100%, I do have 50 years. And I do what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. And not, not trying to chase the quick reinforcement so that you Sure. Can well, it's the quick external loop. But I mean, like at a certain point, you, you, start, you start to develop mastery even around pursuing goals. So, like, I have, I've had enough past, like, this is book three from the $100 million series. Every month, I get thousands of reviews and DMs and people who say their lives change from the first two books. The hard part was book one when I have none of that for a year and a half. But once that one's out, leads, I'm like, well, I'm getting reinforcement every day from my writing. And so I write. And so now I have two books worth of that. And once the third book's out, there'll be three books worth of that. And so maintaining that gets easier and easier just because I have regular reinforcement for writing. Not, not necessarily this book, but writing in general. And so that then means I can, I can generalize past good experiences onto how I act and work now. That's why like, you, become, you become an expert at pursuing goals because you have pursued goals in the past. I just use writing as an example, but I've pursued goals in the past and sticking it out has had big payoffs. And so when I feel like I'm sticking it out again, I'm reminded 
of the past times I've stuck it out and it's been worth it. The hard part is for the people who haven't stuck anything out because they've never, they've never seen it work. And so the first one's always the hard one. It's like you just have to have faith on some level. You just have to fucking believe that it'll work out. And the, the thing that carries you over the bridge in the short term is that you are getting better. And if you can just focus on that, then even if the, the crowd doesn't cheer when you give your presentation or you don't sell books or whatever it is, you'll know. And so it's funny because I look back at the presentation that I gave five years ago, and I really am embarrassed. But I'm not embarrassed at the effort I put in then. Because the effort I put in then, I really did think it was really good. I just didn't know what good could be. Because I also gave myself 20 hours rather than 200 hours. And so if I only had 20 hours, maybe that is the best I can do. And maybe today that's still the best I could do. I just give myself way more time. But the problem with giving yourself way more time once you see how much good good can be, is that you realize how few projects you can do. Right. Which is why you just have to be, that's why like the biggest guys and biggest business titans in the world talk so much about focus because it's not, it's not that like focus is the thing, it's just that it takes so much fucking time to do something right that you can't do more than one thing. So it might be almost part of that like, if, I know we keep saying the word happiness, but like happiness equation to have less things that you're trying to optimize for in, in your set of things that you're working on. Right? If you wanna be exceptional at something, it means you have to put a lot of input into it and you can't be exceptional at very many things because of how many inputs you have and how limited they are. So if time is an input, we all have the same amount of time. And if it takes a huge amount of that time to get good at one thing, then if you take that as the assumption we're basing this on, then there's just not many things you can get very good at. And so then it takes some level of selection to be like, what thing do I wanna get good at? How does the one and zero brand fit into this and, and kind of how did you conceptualize? Well, the one of zero brand is very much aligned with this. Um, I should have my nose strip on. I took it off this morning. Um, you just pasted it on. Um, the whole idea was, you know, it's so funny. I saw, I saw the background of my gym. It said, um, that picture that I posted of like one of my first video content. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. It said, it said the back of the wall. I made this, I made this quote up and I painted it. You can see how ugly the paint is in the back wall. It says, um, strength doesn't come from what, Strength doesn't come from doing what you think you can, but doing what you think you can't, is what I think it says. Which I don't agree with the word strength, it should be growth. But anyways, I like the idea. And so I think that one of zero is very much like that, which is, you know, one of one is doing something that only you can do. One of zero is doing something that you've never done before, and that ideally no one else could do. And so it's an amount of work that most people just don't comprehend. And it's really hard to even describe it. Cause like I can say I spent six hours a day for 18 months on this one project and people nod their heads. But spend six fucking hours on one thing once and then, then do it 500 times. And then like you'll start to see like the soul crushing amount of effort that it takes to stick with it. Um, now I've been able to extend how long I work on projects because just like the abusive husband thing or the abusive spouse thing. Like in the beginning, you can have a short project, you get a win. I can work a little longer the next time. I can work a little longer the next time. Books, really good books, are one of the hardest projects to do because you get z almost zero reinforcement. It's very punishing for most of the time um, until, quote, the end. But the process itself, there is some, some sort of joy in being the type of person who is able to endure that. Because I, I have... I have a lot of entrepreneur friends who are like, oh, I, I just finished my book. I'm gonna write a book just like you did. I was like, no, you won't. No, you won't. Because you know they're not willing to put in the time. No. They're like, it worked well for him, I'll do that too. His book was so good, I'll write one too. Doesn't work that way. They've never even written anything. So they're starting at like where I was when I was 15. And I would say the same degree, it's probably like people who look at Mr. Beast now, they're like, oh, I'll just go make a YouTube video. It's like, he started when he was 13. And he's been spending more than six hours a day trying to make videos since then. And so there's just like so much depth of knowledge that you can get that just takes time. But the thing is, is from the happiness perspective, I find a lot of joy in excellence. And I think that work well done provides dividends forever. So if we were to think about like subjective well-being or like purpose or meaning or utility or usefulness, any of those, whatever one you want to optimize for, like I am proud of the first book I wrote. 
I'm proud of the second book I wrote. I'm proud of the third book I wrote. And I'm proud of the book that I'm writing right now. And when I look back on them, every time I see them and I see people benefit from them, I get a reward for a one-time input. Even though it was a year, for the rest of my life, I will get rewarded for that effort. And so it just encourages me more and more to do things the right way. And I think people who build exceptional products think about products the same way, which is like, it has to be right. It just has to. It's, the, it's, it's all the hundred details. It's not the big idea. It's the hundred details that make the difference between, like the Mr. Beast videos versus other people who try to be like Mr. Beast. It's a hundred details that make his videos better. Yeah, it's not like one caption. Yeah, it's not just the thumbnail, right? Like it's not that. It's a hundred things. I've heard you uh, say the word joy a couple times. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm wondering if you have a distinction between happiness and joy and if that's a helpful thing to explain. Um, I see joy a lot as just being present in the moment because I think you can joyfully mourn. Like if someone's, you know, died, I think you can, there's, there's, you can find joy um, in, in a mourning experience if you're consoling someone else. How is that? I think it's just being present and being okay with experiencing life. So I, I mean, I, that's how I see joy. Now I haven't defined it and I'll probably spend more time defining the words, but um, I just see it as being present. Like I am, I experience joy when I am present. Like I'm enjoying this. I feel very present right now. As soon as you give up the goal of happiness or even meaning, then it stops being this thing that's outside of you. And so it allows you to be present in the moment and do what you want to do or do what you need to do. And so if you always have this thing that you're measuring against, one, there's always a delta between where you are and where it is. But I think oftentimes it'll optimize for the wrong path. And I think happiness for most people is pleasure seeking. So it, they call it happiness, but it's really hedonism. And most, I don't like to appeal to religion, but in terms of old ideologies, most people have found, and I'm sure there is some science that I don't know, um, that people who pursue hedonistic lifestyles tend to be the most empty um, and the least fulfilled. And so I think people have just swapped the word happy or hedon hedonism for happiness. And they think they wouldn't want to say that. But if you look at the actual activities they're pursuing, they're almost purely pleasure seeking. What makes an activity only pleasure seeking versus something that will build long term good? Well, I think it, it's just time, time scale. It's short term, long term. Like something that most pleasure based activities are, um, they're pleasure now at the sacrifice of goal or something later. To be fair, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I'm just saying like, know what we're optimizing for. Is that why that, um, that line that, that I think we talked about once of uh, desire is a contract? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, there was this big philosophy website and then Naval quoted that site. Um, and it was a desire is a contract we make with ourselves to be unhappy until we get what we want. Um, and I mean, I fundamentally agree. Whenever you want something, it means you don't have it. And you basically create deprivation within yourself to motivate behavior. So if you see motivation is the equal opposite of deprivation, like you're horniest when you haven't fucked for a while. You are hungriest when you haven't eaten for a while. You're, you have a huge motivation to sleep when you're exhausted. Right, and so if we want something, we create deprivation within ourselves to motivate ourselves to get it. But by creating deprivation, we basically create, um, now he calls it unhappiness, but I don't know if I necessarily agree with that as the, I think we just, we create deprivation. Because would you still say there is a gap between what you have and what you want? Sure, yeah. Like you want something that you don't have. <laughs> But I mean, I think um, the, the way to skirt that is, in, is wanting a challenge. And so if you just genuinely want to fight bigger and bigger bosses, then the fact that you get the gold at the end becomes, like if anything, the gold at the end is like irrelevant. You just want to find the next boss. And most of the champions that are out there that I've seen, you have the Michael Jordans, the, I mean, a lot of Olympians have huge depression after they get a gold because now what? 
And so it really, and I think you can see how people, how people react to victory tells you what motivated them or rather what they were deprived of. So if the goal was to be exceptional, then that person hits the gold, sees it as a foregone conclusion, and is just excited to move on to the next thing. If they made their entire life about getting the gold, then they have no idea what to do. Because they were married to the outcome, not the process. And again, I, I think that you can win either way. I absolutely think you can win either way. But it definitely changes how long you can play. Yeah, it's like for the right thing, that gap actually becomes uh, an enjoyable process like intrinsic to well, it's not, it's not even the gap. It's just that if you want the challenge, then you basically create goals to create challenges. You don't create goals to achieve goals. You, you set new goalposts just so that you can have the, the trial. And so like, someone's like, what happens when you hit a billion? I was like, I'll make it 10. And when I have 10, I'll hit 100. Like, it, like it, it doesn't matter, because I'll die and I'll give it all away anyways. It's irrelevant. But it's just like, I want to I wanna be better. And the only way to be better is to do the work that I know I should do. And so that way, every day, I'm doing the work, and at least for me, that has worked. Do whatever you want. That has worked for me. Because I feel like some people talk about that, like moving the goalpost things and the negative of like, oh, people yeah. reach one thing and then, but I guess if you take it from the frame of these are just more challenges that I'll enjoy from, then it's not a problem if the goalpost move. I don't think it's a problem. I mean, if you beat level one boss, then what? You, you, the game moves you up, you play harder monsters, and then you try and beat level two boss. It's, it's, it's this whole fallacy around being done. It's this whole idea that we can finish. We can work so hard, we never have to work again. We can fuck so good, we never have to fuck again. We can eat so big, we never have to eat again. We can sleep so well, we never have to sleep again. It's just a fallacy, it's not true. And people lose their lives trying to find that one meal, or that one fuck, or that one you know, uh, sleep, or that one goal that'll satisfy them for good. And it never does. I think a story that would really contextualize this for the audience is like that period when you were getting ready to sell Gym Launch that you just, mm -hmm. you know, it sounds like you felt a little lower. Oh yeah. So I, um, so when I was selling Gym Launch, there was basically a year where I couldn't really work. Um, mostly because if I worked in the business, then it would look like I was a key man to the business. And if I, and I didn't know if we were going to sell, so I didn't want to start another company. So I basically just had to like subsist. I could even start new in, in, in endeavors or initiatives within the company. So I just had to do nothing basically. And so for me, it was the most depressed I've been. If you look at some of the videos during that, that time period, it, it, a lot of them are me being pretty sad and being like, what the fuck is life about? But it's just that for me, um, like, you know, again, I'm not religious, but I do find it interesting that the first thing God gave Adam in the Bible before giving him a wife was giving him a job. Work. Tend to the garden before he gave him a wife. And I find that really interesting. I don't like, religion, religion aside, um, we're built to work. And so for me especially, I'm built to work. And so if I'm working, I'm good. And like the, the days that I enjoy the most are the days that I work the longest. And so I just try and remove everything that stops me from doing that. You said something interesting about hell the other day, or heaven, heaven the idea of heaven and potentially being kind of like a hell. It's like not, not doing anything. <sighs> oh, it sounds horrible. Well, I mean, if the idea, like, I think most people envision, most people envision heaven like the one meal that's going to be so good, they're never going to eat again. They're going to be so elated to just be singing with the angels. It's like, yeah, but play it out. Like, then what? Like, okay, got it. We sang with the angels at, from nine to 10. And then from, you know, then I had the, uh, a feast, you know what I mean? From 10 to 11, but I got to keep my my idealized body, my, my, I don't know, Christianese for idealized body, glorified um, physical form. I got to keep that the whole time. It's like, okay, well now it's noon. Now what do I do? Well, dogs are all there because all dogs go to heaven. Great. Good to know. But if your wife dies, then it's like you have three wives up there. You're like, yeah, but I mean, technically we were at different times. So it's like, where do we, how do we do with that? Whatever. God's figured it out. But um, again, I think it's just this fallacy of work-life balance. Like, I think heaven is literally just an, an extrapolation of work-life balance as a concept, which is, I will just be able to do life and no work. But the first thing God fucking does in the Bible is give someone work. And so, I think so many people would be helped out if they just stopped labeling it as a bad thing and started seeing it as the way to get what they want. And then, 
eventually to make it the thing they want. Because the, and this is like a little bit of an abstract idea, so it takes a little bit more processing power to, to conceptualize this, but there's goals, and then there's working to hit the goals, and then there's the idea of love the process, but there's the, un, the subscript of so that you can hit the goal. But in my opinion, it's just work. Not so that you can. It's just work. And it's like, well, what do you mean? It means like working is the goal. Like working as hard as you can and learning how hard you can work and how well you can work and how right you can make things and how well you can do them. Like pushing that, expanding my capacity to work, not so that I can. Like expanding my capacity to work so that I can work more. <laughs> like if you can do that, then you have the self-fulfilling loop and then you also become completely divorced from the outcomes, which ironically, when you do work that way, you do have outsized outcomes compared to everybody else, but you do it because you work so fucking hard because you're addicted to working and you like that game and the goals just happen as a consequence. But I don't even like saying the goals just happen as a consequence because it still gives the idea to the listener or the watcher right now that that's the point. And it's not. Because even if your goal is to be the richest man in the world, okay, let's say that's your goal. For how long? Every richest man in the world is rich for, the richest man in the world for, they touch the top. And then boom, something changes in the economy, whatever it is, and then another richest man in the world comes up. Like, who was the richest man 20 years ago? Actually, 30 years ago. A bunch of Japanese guys. And then Japan's economy crashed. No one even knows their guys' names. And so it's like, making the goal, even as audacious as those guys' goals were, right? And let's say you're number two, but even let's say you're number one. For how long? And so that's why I, I think that the work is the goal. Not so that you can, just the work is the goal. And learning how hard you can work and being proud of yourself for how much harder you work today than you did yesterday. You have a tweet that like perfectly ties this together. You hit the goals that you said you wanted to to be happy a long time ago. Yeah. Is that kind of what you mean here? Um, what do you actually mean? Well, it's, it's um, you've already hit goals that you said would make you happy. And I might have put years ago or something like that in there, but it's just fun to be like, years ago you set goals that today you've hit and you said you would be happy and yet you're not. And so it's because the concept of setting these goals presumed, like the ultimate unhappiness <laughs> equation is, uh, if I get X, I'll be happy, right? Like we all know that one. Because um, that's the, the, the guarantee of it not, not happening. Because it automatically, the entirety of your existence is outside of yourself and then the moment you hit it, then what? You said another one and then it's outside of yourself, right? Um, and so if, if the goal doesn't change your entire life, then you can basically be achieving it every day. If the goal is to work as hard as you can, every day you can work as hard as you can. You can be in the state that you're desiring if the goal is the state. Yeah. The goal is the state of being that you have when you work exceptionally hard, when you do hard work worth doing. And you know if you left some in the tank. And I love, I think this is Jesse Itzler says this, but I, I, I really love it. There's a handful of like sayings that I've gotten from other entrepreneurs that I really love. I'll, I'll give you three right now. I'm side questing, but just deal with it. One is um, Michael Dell says, play nice, but win. I just love that. The second one is uh, Andy Frisell has 100 to zero, which I really, really like, which is basically like society when you're up, you know, in football, let's say you're up 30 to nothing and it's halftime. Society says, put in, your, put in your backups, put in your third strings, like take it easy and play. And he's like, no, fuck that. 100 to zero, step on their throat and fucking kill everyone. And I like that from a, from a perspective of, of like, don't let off the gas. Like, just because they lost doesn't mean that you now have to dilute yourself to lower yourself to their standard. And so it's like, yeah, so what if like, it takes this much to win? I don't care if it takes this much to win, I wanna be here. Because if, if you then change how you play, because everybody else isn't as good, you lower yourself. You don't raise them up. That's society trying to make it appear as though people are better than they are. And I, I'm a big fan of like, they should know they lost 100 to zero. 
they should know how much room they have to improve. And also to the same degree, I should know how much further ahead I am. Um, and the goal shouldn't be either way. Mm -hmm. I'm going to keep playing the way I play. If we happen to finish at 100 to 0, we happen to finish at 100 to 0. But I'm not going to let off because that's who I am. Um, and the third one was uh, Jesse Itzler has this thing where he has with his kids, which I really like. It was um, after they do a, a marathon, because he's really big in endurance sports, and so his kids are too. And so whenever they finish, a lot of them pulled up a, a zero, which I really like, and it means nothing left in the tank. And he said, I just want you, I don't care if you win, he's like, I just want you to have nothing left. And I, I think about that as like the goal. So the goal is to have nothing left. And I think that on the micro level and on the macro level, like if every day, like my favorite days are the days that I get into bed and I'm fucking exhausted, but proud of the work that I've done. I have nothing left. I've left it all on the field. And so like that's the goal. The other stuff society chooses to measure me by, but when I measured myself that way, it distracted me and I didn't enjoy my life. Um, but just living that day as many times in a row as I can until I die is my plan. And at the end, on the macro, being able to hold this up and be like, I got nothing left. I'm used up. But until then, I will continue to try and be useful. And so that I, like, I like all three of those statements, and they, to me, kind of embody a lot of the, the values of one of zero, which is not just doing only what you can do, but doing things that you didn't know you could yet. Let's say someone wants to take this frame of infinite games, but, okay. their, but, but their thing isn't work. Like, you right. have someone like Mother Teresa who's like, I just want right? to... Dude. Let's okay. This yeah, yeah. So, okay. So, Alex, what if my goal isn't work? The goal is always work. It's just what you're working on. And so whether you're like, I want to have the best marriage, then cool. It takes fucking work. If the goal is to have the best kids, then parenting, is that not fucking work? It's fucking work. If the goal is to have the best physique, it's fucking work. If the goal is to have the best career, it's work. If the goal is to just be the ultimate version of you, it's work in all those arenas. And being mindful of what you want to optimize for. Um, in terms of how many hours you want to allocate to each. And so, like, most people live lives. I mean, I'm going to use Rogan's quote from somebody else, but of quiet desperation, because they're hoping to find a way around work. But work is the way. It's the only way. Because everything else, if it didn't require work, then you'd already have it. Breathing doesn't really require work. Most people do it. There's plenty of things that we just don't think about because we have them automatically. And so everything that you don't automatically have, you have to expend effort to get. And so everyone just wants a way to get things without working, which I understand. Don't get me wrong. But the thing is, is that... I remember, actually, this is a weird thought. So I remember when I was graduating college, I had this, um, there was like, it was like a billion dollar uh, Powerball. Like it was like, you know, one of the, when it kind of goes over a billion dollars. And um, I bought a Powerball ticket with my girlfriend, just as like a, like a fun joke, not like I didn't, I was like hoping to win. And what's weird is that I remember as the drawing was happening, I, I actually had this huge fear that I win. Because if I would win, then it would mean that I would never get a shot to prove myself. That I, that I could have done it. Because literally from that point on, if you win, nothing you do matters. Like I could never prove that I had any medal whatsoever. <laughs> like everyone would always say, it was because you won the fucking Powerball, dude. And I think the big reason that I didn't become a physician was because my dad has a successful practice. And I knew that if I became a physician, it didn't matter how good of a physician I was, it would always be because people would say it was because of him. Now, that was then. I cared a lot about what people think. I probably still do. Um, less though, but still on some degree. Um, but that was, and so just to give, I guess, the audience an insight into like how I think about things, if it's valuable for you. Like, if you are afraid <laughs> of winning the lottery because it won't give you a chance to prove to yourself who you want to be or who you want to become, then I think you're on the right path.
I love the inverse of that, which is that everything that's right now, which is hard, it's the opposite of the lottery, is yeah. the biggest fucking blessing. Yeah, and if we were to take this in the equal opposite perspective of, if winning the lottery is the ultimate way to not win, because you never get the opportunity to prove yourself, not necessarily like prove to other people, but prove to yourself. And so maybe said differently, the reason the, the Powerball terrified me is like, I wouldn't be able to prove to me, independent of what other people said, but like, I would never know if I could do it because I had a billion dollars behind me. And so every hardship that you encounter, if you reframe it as the story that you will someday tell to yourself of the person that you've become based on the dragons you've slain and the obstacles you've overcome, then I think that makes those obstacles a unique opportunity for self-improvement because we can be grateful for these things. I think, um, I think Jocko, uh, has, a, has a whole bit on this where whenever something bad happens, he says, good. And I think it's a great trained response because if something bad happens, my trained response isn't good. It's, I will tell the story someday. And so I think if you have that frame, then everything serves you. Because if, if th something good happens, cool. If something bad happens, it'll be a story that I will someday tell. Because it assumes that you will live through it and it assumes that you will eventually figure it out. And so, then you can't lose, as long as you don't quit. If you're cool talking about this, are these some of the conversations you have with your wiser self? Yeah, I haven't actually had a ton of uh, Solomon conversations recently because I haven't had a lot of, um, so because of the wonderful therapist that uh, Solomon is, I don't, I don't have to stick to a schedule. And so, I would say that like there are times, yeah, so, so there's a lot of research that suggests that we are better at giving advice than we are adhering to it. And so they've done like a simple example is they gave two whitewashed scenarios of somebody and told the reader to give advice to the person who's in the whitewashed scenarios. The thing is, is that the person in the whitewashed scenarios was them and they don't adhere to the advice, adhere to the advice that they give. And so they did this to just demonstrate that people, one, don't listen to their own advice, and two, that the advice that people give tends to be better than what they do. And they postulate that the reason for that is because you, be, you can be uh, non-emotional and detached giving advice to somebody else. You can be more rational about the advice, whereas when you're in it, you have more emotions, you make less rational decisions. And so extrapolating that out for me, I have a lot of relatively complex business dealings that happen on a regular basis. M most of my stressors, anxieties, come from decisions that I have to make with incomplete information. And so if I were to have a therapist, I would probably spend a huge amount of time trying to catch them up on all the relative information. And then I would hope that they somehow have the business acumen to help me navigate these decisions, which they probably wouldn't. And then even if they did, I would have to hope that their incentive was aligned with mine, which theirs is billable hours, not me making them as money. And so there's just a lot of problems, I think, with the traditional model, and so, at least for me. And so I was like, okay, well, how can I get somebody who has completely aligned incentives, who has all the same information as me, um, who can give me good advice? And so the person who meets all of those qualifications is future me. And it's like, well, yeah, wouldn't it be nice to talk to that person? Well, what's interesting is if you, if you, if you switch your hat around and you're like, okay, I'm, I'm now future me, I'm going to give advice to younger me. Um, it's a wild ride, but the dialogue is super powerful because you don't sugarcoat it for you. And you don't need to waste time prefacing and say like, hey, take this away. I mean, like you don't have to get it, you just be like, it's such direct communication. Um, and the advice that I would get is often advice that I give, and I give really good business advice. <laughs> only, I only say that measured based on the company's growth that we have. Um, and so taking that advice, oftentimes I too need to be more patient. Oftentimes I too need to keep doing what has been working. Oftentimes I too need to wait until we have enough data to make the next call. Um, and I have to give time time. And so now some therapist could say this to me and I'd be like, well, what the fuck do you know? How's your business going, right? Obviously not that well, you're talking to me for an hourly rate, whatever. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but I'm just saying that their goals for business and their level of aptitude for business is probably not the same as mine. And so it'd be really hard for me to even put any weight on their opinion. But future me is much smarter and wiser than I am, of course. And so I do weigh their decisions. And so 
The other piece is that I don't have to have a generic, it's 60 minutes. Like why does, why does a therapy session need to be 60 minutes? It should be as long as it needs to be or as short as it needs to be to solve a problem. And so I've had times that it's been seven minutes. I've had times when it's been 90. I've had times when it's uh, three times in one week and I've had times where I don't, I don't have to have a quote session with Solomon for a month. And so it's usually when I'm at big decision points where I have more frequent communication to try and like figure out an issue or problem. But once, once I'm kind of on a path, I usually stay on that groove for basically as long as I can. And so um, over the last two years, I had a lot more big directional decisions that I needed to make with kind of the media stuff that we do and then also the investments in acquisition.com. But a lot of the early theses that we had we have enough data now that I could make decisions on them, and I have made decisions on them, and so now it's just about sticking to the plan. So what did that process look like? You have a blank like Google Doc, and then you hmm. alternating lines? Yeah, I just literally pull up a Google Doc. I set a date so that I have all my conversations in one doc, and um, I just hit enter. So it's just me, him, me, him. He asks a question, I answer. Like, um, And it sounds silly to do this, but do it once, and you'll realize that it's, it's weird. It, it works, for me at least. Have you looked, ever looked back on like, what was the first, do you remember the first time you did this? Yeah, I do, I do, I do. We had, a, we had an unfortunate event that, uh, that, had, that had happened that had not gone the way that I had wanted it to. And um, I describe these types of scenarios as, you're a, you're a rare baseball collect, card collector and you have an incredibly rare card. Um, like, super, super valuable. And then you're a two-year-old when you're away, gets into the box and destroys it. What do you do? Do you hit the kid? They don't even know. Like, what do, you, do, do you get upset at your wife? Like, what do you do? You just gotta take it. There's no, there's, no, there's no action. You just take it. And so I had, I had one of those incidences from a business perspective. Um, and so I just, Talked to Solomon about it, and he was like, you just take it. He's like, and you get to tell that story someday about the skin that you have and the things that you've gone through. And then the next hard time something happens, you'll be able to compare it to that and be like, well, it wasn't as bad as that. Right. And then you take measures, I mean, take measures to prevent the next card from... Do the best you can. Right. Yeah. But even when I thought about that, because in that particular situation, it was like, okay, what information you know, should I have had or... Um, this is actually a really common one. This happens in investing a lot, but like um, people are like, oh, I shouldn't have made that investment. Or, I should have bought Bitcoin in 2013. Well, should you have? Because the thing is, is that if you have that decision-making framework, then it means that you would have invested in a hundred other bullshit things at that same time period, which means that you might, like that decision-making calculus probably would have led you to ruin more than the one time that it worked. And so in order for me to learn from the experience, I have to think about what, what do I change about my decision-making framework to prevent something like that happening in the future? And if there wasn't anything that could really happen in the decision-making framework, then sometimes you just get kicked in the nuts. Sometimes your kid just takes the Babe Ruth thing and treads it, and there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah, and, and to, to loop it back a little bit, it's like if the goal was for you to enjoy the process of you know, even acquiring that card in the first place, sure. the card. Collection, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you're going to die. doesn't matter. <laughs> like, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm the same way because I, I collect gym equipment. Like, I love gym equipment. And I'll give a different example. Um, I had a house in Austin, and we had this big, really nice infinity pool that had, like, this nice view. And somebody came over and was like, hey, be honest with me. How many times do you even use this pool? And I was like, I use it five times a day. And he was like, what? And I was like, every time I walk past it, I look at it, and I like it. It's just like somebody saying like, Alex, why don't you do more functional training with your body? I was like, my function is to look jacked. I use it every second of every day. What are you talking about? And so it's like, and this is probably a good kind of decision fallacy to look at because a lot of people will criticize your decisions because they use their way of valuing the decision and assume it's the same way you value a decision. And so to the gym equipment thing, I have a lot of gym equipment. And I enjoy 
spending time in my gym. Like, I like walking in there. I like everything the way it is. I like the pieces. I remember how I got them. I remember the workouts I've done on them. I'm reminded of the people I did those sessions with when I did a brutal whatever. And so it's just a really positive, they're all basically totems of positive reinforcement. So kind of like the card collection. Like, people go through their card collection. People go through their car collection because it reminds them of all the positive things that have happened. Um, more so than they collect it because they want to sell it someday. Like, I'm not going to sell the gym equipment. Why would I? I like it. I use it. But I think, I think it follows along the same thing as like, um, I enjoy obsessing about it. I enjoy getting everything right. I enjoy the pieces. I enjoy the layout. And like, I spend way too much time on it if I only was optimizing for money, which I'm not. I mean, it's a component, but it's not the only thing. I actually love hearing you talk about German because I think it's like an interesting look. And, you know, anytime you hear someone talk about something they love, it's like a really great insight. What do you like? like I hear you talk about strength curves. Yeah. And, you know. I feel like we'll do that with the equipment because it'll make oh, more okay. sense there. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think, I think that, I think, at least for me, like everybody, I think most people, I'll say this way, regardless of culture, all cultures respect excellence. And excellence comes from nuance of understanding. And so people look at bodybuilders, for example, and they see them on stage and they're like, oh my God, that's so gross. And it's because they don't have any level of appreciation for the many things that go into that, not just the effort, but even from a product perspective, they're like, wow, Look at how, look at his delts compared to his biceps. Look at where his muscle bellies tie in. Look at, um, look at his lat spread. Look how small he was able to keep his waist while also building such a big back. Look at his vascularity compared to somebody else who might be more, you know, grainy, whatever. And so they usually don't even have the language to describe what they're seeing. And so it's like me trying different wines. It just tastes like wine, you know what I mean? But for a connoisseur, they actually get to enjoy wine so much more because they have so many more ways to enjoy it. Like Eskimos have seven words for snow and we only have one because they have more experience with snow. So they have a deeper understanding of it. And so I think most people respect excellence and excellence only comes from depth. It comes from exposing yourself to the same thing for many, 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 many periods of time so that you can pick up those little nuances of, you know what, actually if I move my, my, my wrist this way when I do this one, I get that little bit at the end. And if I, if I change my, my chair angle, I actually get this other really cool piece. And you know what, if I put my thing on my, you know, if I put my dumbbells on my legs first, before I put them over my head, I actually get a different, you know, stimulus or whatever it is. Um, and like that just comes from reps, which is why there's a really great, I mean, in the iron game, there's a great culture of passing down these little nuances. And that's kind of like all apprenticeships, even though it's not work for a job. Well, I guess for the top bodybuilders it is, but for most people it's not a job. But there's a, there's a craft to it. And I think just being a student of the craft um, is the goal. I think we've lost some of that craftsmanship. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean we've, it's just the crafts have changed. You know what I mean? Like developer wasn't a craft. <laughs> you know, before. Um, I mean, shoot, making media wasn't a craft. Uh, you know, quote, being an influencer, making content wasn't a craft. Like, these are all crafts. There's just new crafts that replaced old crafts. Um, but excellence is always respected across cultures and across times. Like, if we go into the future and there's some new thing that I've ever heard of, but I find out that this guy's exceptional at it, I will respect him for the effort. And so, like, chunk down one or chunked up one, um, I believe that effort is the universal currency of respect. And so this is also for the guys who are out there um, who want to be more respected. You will always get respect for work. Chinese, Mexican, black, white, Asian, gay, straight, whatever. You work your ass off, people will respect you for it. Now the problem comes when you think you're working your ass off, but you really aren't working that hard. And that's where the disconnect is. It's really like, I work so hard, but it's kind of like the um, like the 10 hours of prep for a presentation versus 30. It's like you think you're working hard until you see what hard looks like. And then you're like, fuck, I wasn't even working nearly as hard. But I see that as encouraging because it means that so many people have so much underutilized potential because they just haven't even learned how to work. I remember when I did my, um, I did a legal internship in France. So I had to do translating legal documents from French to English. Um, horrible, <laughs> honestly, just terrible work. And um, uh, yeah. I was because I thought because people were like you're good at writing you're persuasive you should be a lawyer and I was like sure I'll try that so I went to it was a company called Arkema um, 
and I did I did my summer internship there my junior year, and there was this uh, partner at the basically the, it was corporate law but it was equivalent of a partner um, who was there and she walked by my office and she like. I think she might have talked to me one other time, like just to like welcome me to the office, and this was the only other time she ever spoke to me. And so she uh, she like did one of these like pe- peeked her head into my hole or whatever they where they kept me to like translate documents, and uh, she was like, you know, how's it coming or whatever. And I was like, I was like, man, I was like, I'm just I'm just working really hard on this and just trying to. It was like just I'm just working really hard, and she just like looked at me and she just laughed, and I was like, what the f- what? And she was like, you don't even know how to work. And I, I just remember thinking that, and then, and then she just walked away. <laughs> and um, and I, I went to the guy who was like two years above me. I was like, I was basically trying, you know, you'd get his job as like the lowest level. I was like his peon, right? And I was like, what the fuck? And uh, he's like, yeah, like she, like they work, so many more hours than we do and like have so much higher stakes than we do. He's like, you're just translating documents, dude. <laughs> like if you get something wrong, it's on them, not on you. And I remember thinking about that because like I thought I was working really hard, but they had to go review everything to make sure I didn't mess up. And especially in a, in a, in a job like law where you usually have billable hours, like you literally in order to get paid, you have to spend time. Like it's just like it just it's just it's so clearly connected that those people just kill themselves in terms of the amount of work that they, they put out. And now that I'm at my at my position now, I a hundred percent agree. Like I didn't know how to work. Like I was like the idea that I could work hard, like she's like, you don't even know how to work yet. And um, and it was only later that I had a different guy who was like, you'll learn when you get older. They're like, it just take, it takes time to learn the skill of effort. And so I really genuinely believe that succeeding isn't hard. Learning how to try is hard. Once you learn how to try, if you just try at anything compared to other people, you'll win. Because everyone, the bar is so low to win nowadays. Even like, and I'll, I'll give the, the, you know, the objective stats for guys. It's like, if you're the average guy, you're a thousand dollars in debt, you're overweight and like that's the average and so like if you're just not in debt and not overweight you're already above average (laughs) like that's it like that's the that's the bar it's just because no one knows how to try and no one knows how to like suck for a little bit and you only have to suck for a little bit once because then you learn that sucking for a little bit has a payoff and then you can just extrapolate that you know over and over again but you just have to make it through the first one but no one's willing to do that because they care so much about what everyone else thinks and they feel like they should immediately be good because that's what social media tells them. When you're working, there's kind of like billable hours. and It's like there's work that actually counts and there's work that's kind of just like bullshit work and the ability to distinguish between that probably matters a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I measure myself on output based on how much of the work that I do is correct and done. And so I can usually see if my rate of work has slowed down because um, I've been doing this for a long enough period of time that I can tell when my you know, if I'm making slides for a presentation that it's like my rate of work starts to really drop or my quality of work starts to drop or from writing my quality or my speed starts to drop. So like I know when that happens. Sometimes it takes longer to get there. Sometimes it takes less time. Um, I think that does take some time. I think in the beginning though, you should expect junk work as in like junk volume where this is a hard one, but you have to get over it is that while you're still learning it, let's say you reached your point of maximum like production at, you know, hour five and then you still have like another five hours of work, I would say do the extra hours of work because you won't know what that limit is until you get there. And if the next five hours of work, when you come back the next day, you look at it with fresh eyes and you say like, this isn't good enough, I wouldn't see it as a loss. I would see that your ability to see that it wasn't good enough, you would only be able to do if you had already done the five hours of junk work and that still got you further ahead than if you hadn't done it at all. And so even if I delete everything, I still have everything in my head. So like, for example, we've made videos before where we'll do the entire video and at the very end we're like, I feel like we could just do that one again and make it better. And then we do it again and it is way better. So it's not that the first video was a waste, it was the first video set up the second video or the first and second set up the third. And so Leeds had 19 drafts. Like the 18th set up the 19th. 
And it's not that the first 18 were a waste, it was just that they were steps. And so it's just that, I mean, I'll go biblical on you again, um, but uh, I can't remember the proverb, but it says, uh, in all work there is profit, uh, which I like the more rhetorical way of saying like, uh, the work works on you more than you work on it, which is that you always benefit from work. In all work, there is profit. In all work, there is benefit. And because like the five hours extra that you do editing and then you realize the next day, it's not that that wasn't profitable for you. It's not that you didn't benefit from it. You benefited from it. And then once you benefit from it, that comes back out again and the work benefits. And so I used to say this when I was um, growing businesses earlier. I said either the business grows or I grow. Or both. But like one of them's happening. Because if the business is growing, great. I might not be growing at all. Maybe I am, but the business is growing for sure. The business stops growing, it's getting hard. So I start growing. And then once I grow enough, the business starts growing again. And so like growth is always happening. It's just where you're measuring it. Right. So let's say someone's been following this video. It's like, step one, they, they broke the belief that they need to be happy. It's useful. You know, step two, find yeah. intrinsic value in, in, in the process of improving. Step three, but how? Like for you, was it going into environments where you learned, you saw people being useful, you saw people working hard? How could someone do that if they're young? And Everything comes down to fi figuring out what the input-output equation is. If you don't know the input-output equation of getting good at your skill, you will be lost until you find it. And so like, if you want to be a good coder, it's 10,000 hours of coding. If you want to be a good editor, it's 10,000 hours of editing. You want to be a good salesman, it's 10,000 hours on the phone. If you want to be like, it just is. And so for me, as soon as I figure that out, then I just want to start chipping away at it as fast as I can. And so if, it's like, I can do 10,000 hours over 10 years or I can do it over four years. You know, it's funny because people see a 2,000 hour work year, but there's like, there's so many more hours than that. Like, it's ridiculous. There's so many more hours than 2,000 hours. Like, there's 104 days of the year that are weekends. And if you add in federal holidays, and two weeks of paid vacation, you have 129 days a year out of 365. And of the, of the remaining days that you quote work, you work eight of the 24. So like, there's so many more hours <laughs> that, you can, that you can do stuff and get better than people give themselves credit for. And so it's just about, uh, see I was like, I was, I'm used to add my little tick for where my ring is. Um, find the input output equation and then dump as much as you possibly can into the input side and get rid of everything that interferes with it. Which also means the people in your life who interfere with you doing the input out of equation. Um, the environmental cues, so as in like, if you, like I work in as, as closely as I can in no windows, no sound. That's how I work. I don't want any distractions. Some people work better with whatever. I have a hard time believing that. Maybe they enjoy working more. I doubt they work better. Some people are like, I listen to music when I work. There's just a ton of research that shows that that's just, it, like empirically you work less well. It's like you just don't. Now, uh, instrumental that doesn't have words, maybe, but like you're using horsepower listening to words, period. And so I want all horsepower, like even if you're balancing on your chair, like you're using brain power. And so I wanna use nothing, I wanna use 100% of my power on the task at hand, and that's it. And, and that means that if I have also stressors outside of my life, people who are bothering me, not just like, you know, people literally interrupting me, but just problems. It's like, I want to resolve those so that I can put all my attention here. Because if I'm trying to type it, I'm thinking about, you know, this snafu I had with somebody, deal with the snafu, and then you'll be able to work more clearly. What if someone doesn't know what they want to apply the input into yet? They don't know that it's writing. They don't know that it's... Yeah. Um, I think that it would behoove you... So, like, everything is... So, okay. It's the fallacy of the perfect pick. So, people think when they're starting out, one, that they should find something they're passionate about. Um, two, that the first thing they pick is the last thing they're going to do for the rest of their life. And I think both of those are false. So, we'll start with the first one. So the fallacy of finding your purpose, or finding your passion, excuse me, is that you're going to love something so much that you immediately fall in love with it. Some people do, the vast majority don't. And real, real, I liked fitness. But as soon as I started my gym, 
which I thought was, quote, pursuing my passion, my life stopped being about fitness. It was about business. And then I had to learn that, and I sucked at it. And so, like, even the idea that I'm just going to do my passion isn't even the reality of, quote, doing your passion. Because doing my passion became work, and I started hiring trainers and, and systemizing onboarding and getting them trained up so they wouldn't suck on the floor because I had to do other things. And all of a sudden, I made my, quote, passion into work, <laughs> as other people define work. Um, and so you create passion, you don't find it. Um, and you create it by being willing to suck for a very long period of time until you get good. And then when you get good at stuff, you tend to like it. One. The second fallacy was that you, whatever you, is the perfect pick, is that you're going to pick the perfect thing the first time. Life is long. People change career directories more now than ever before. And so I prefer the process of approximation, which is, can I just get directional? and then iterate. And so it's like, okay, do you like words or do you like numbers? People are like, I like numbers. Okay, all these careers, probably not for you. Great, one directional change. All right, and then within there, it's like, okay, do I like money numbers or do I like data numbers or do I like computer numbers? It's like, okay, I like data numbers. Great, so now, now we're already in a, like, a zillion career paths in this direction. But the thing is, is that if you then start getting good at becoming a data analyst for an oil company, and then you decide that you want to pivot into, into media buying, there's going to be a lot of generalizable skills there because it was all about data and you did have to learn a lot of stuff. And what I will say is that you get these unique carryovers that only you will have. And so, so Steve Jobs tells a story about how he took calligraphy, right? And it seemed useless at the time. And then fast forward when they had the Mac, they started having different fonts. And they only have different fonts because Steve Jobs at one time took calligraphy. And so the lessons you learn on the first thing you do don't become apparent sometimes until the third, fourth, or fifth thing you do. But that third, fourth, or fifth thing you do, the fact that you did that first thing gives you a unique advantage compared to everyone else who didn't. And so following the tried and true path, there's nothing wrong with that. But there's also nothing wrong with learning. Uh, like There is never a downside to learning more skills period, because you are able to create more unique solutions to problems that you get presented with in the future because of things you've done in the past. And so I'm sure that, like right now, there's not a lot of really jacked investors. <laughs> there are. But I'll bet you that there are things that I have taken from my bodybuilding and powerlifting past that I can see more uniquely than some of them can. And I know more about fitness industry investments than probably they do, both from a consumer and from an owner. I know, like, I still get calls from many, many, like, multi-billion dollar portfolio owners. They're like, hey, we're about to invest in this chain of gyms. What do you think? And I've swayed multi-billions of dollars of decisions being like, I think they're a dog. I think they're going to go down, and here's why. And they're like, fuck, we didn't see that in the data. I'm like, yeah, but if you were in, you'd know that. And so, but I wouldn't, if I was just another data analyst, they'd never call me. And so... The idea of the perfect pit, perfect pick is just a fallacy. So pick a direction. Is this closer or further? This is closer. Okay, cool. Getting warm. Think, think about getting warm, getting hot, rather than this is it. And so then you can start approximating. And the work that you did on a warm before it gets hot isn't wasted because you have a new lens that other people who just went straight there won't have, even if it takes you longer. Because again, life's super long. Andrew Churn and Peggy Churn, who started Panda Express, they're, they're deca billionaires now. They started their first location at 40 years ago, but he's 75 now. So he wasn't like young, he was 35. Start, first location, first, right? Like, and they're richer than most people are or will ever be. And so like, if it takes you 10 years or 20 years, um, it's fine, but I'll also bet you that they, now I have to learn this from them, but I'll bet you they did things before Panda Express that had nothing to do with running Chinese chicken shops, <laughs> right? But those skills still translated over. I was a management consultant, did space cyber and intelligence for the military before starting a gym. How does that translate? Well, I learned a consulting process, and the learning of a consulting process is learning how to solve problems. And so I use that with my gyms, because the consulting process, you go to experts and you ask them what they do. 
So I started interviewing all these gym owners because they were willing to talk about the gyms and I would drive out there every weekend because I had time and I would just spend time at the gym and I'd be like, how do you onboard people? What do your contracts look like? What terms do you use? How do you deal with cancellations? How do you deal with churn? How do you deal with declined cards? And I would ask all of them. And every once in a while, some would be like, oh, I do that. Like, That's good. I'll take that one down. I'll steal that from me. And I would just do that over and over and over again. But I got that from consulting. Other gym owners didn't apply a consulting frame because they weren't consultants first. So if I had maybe started straight into gym ownership right out of college rather than taking two years to be a consultant, I might not have gone as far. So like what felt like a complete waste of time when I was in it, which it did, might have been the thing that made me succeed in the next thing. And so even if you're in it right now, the only thing that I can say is that you want to try as hard as you can and get as many skills as you can in that field, even if you don't think you're going to use it later. And I'll wrap this with this. Um, if you guys haven't seen it, it's, it's a worthwhile movie. It's something called... Um, Slumdog Millionaire. So the premise of the movie is this kid in the slums in India. Um, it basically just tells his story of just like trials and tribulations. He just says bad luck after bad luck after bad luck, the whole movie. And then by chance, at the end of the movie, he gets on their equivalent of uh, who wants to be a millionaire. And so I think it's like 12 questions or something. It's 12 or 20, I don't remember, questions that they ask. And by chance, the haphazard, crazy, bad situations that this guy is in, his whole life amount to him winning and answering each of the questions correctly. And so a lot of times we just need to expand the time horizon and realize that we might be playing our own Slumdog Millionaire movie. It's just that we're in like the third, we're, we're learning the answer to the third question right now, even though we're just getting kicked in the nuts. And so I think if you have that frame and remember that the worst thing that can ever happen is that you die and you're gonna die no matter what, it lowers the stakes a little bit. Dude, man. Good to see you.